Well, if you're looking for the Stay Off My Operating Table podcast, you're in the right place. If you're looking for um, somebody to help you become a much better sleeper and you accidentally ended up here, then you're also in the right place. Because today on the Stay Off My Operating Table podcast, we have, as far as I know, one of, if not the only, world's sleep is a skill experts. I got to admit, Phil, when I saw we've got a sleeping expert scheduled, <laughs> I thought, come Snooze on, vest. <laughs> everybody's good at sleeping. What's what's the deal? And then I went to her website and started digging around. I went, oh, my gosh. So there's the setup. Your turn to hit it. Okay. Yeah, definitely. Well, as as anyone who's read Stay Off My Opera Day, operating table knows sleep is one of the pillars of health that I discuss. And I kind of realized that we haven't talked about it a lot on this podcast. We've talked about most of the other aspects in great de detail. And so I was very excited when we I got introduced to Molly and said, we need you and our audience needs you. Because honestly, what I see in practice is Sleep is a big challenge for people and a big impact on their metabolic health. So very excited for this conversation. And why don't we start, Molly, by having you give a little bit of your background and tell us how you became a sleep expert. Yeah, well, first off, thank you so much for having me. And I completely hear the original kind of question marks that might go off in people's head when they hear about this concept of optimizing your sleep. What can that look like? And I can just say right off the bat that my intention is to provide as many practical takeaways for anyone listening, no matter if you relate to yourself as a great sleeper or a poor sleeper or wherever you are on the spectrum of sleep, we can still take it to the next level 110%. And I'm very confident around that. And that's one of the reasons why I named this company. Sleep is a skill, like any great skill. There's always areas for mastery or opportunities for mastery. So, but the background for me came at it from, I think one of those places where people often come into this passion or obsession with certain areas concerns oftentimes come from kind of trauma or things that did not go so well. And that was certainly my experience. And what that looked like was I now think of my life in a three part series and it's all kind of related to sleep and I'll explain. So the first part of my life, I had a lot of labels and narratives around my sleep. And I would say things like I'm a short sleeper. I'm a night owl. It's in my genes. I'll sleep when I'm dead. You know, just a lot of isms or ways of kind of thinking about sleep where it was almost fixed and something to survive. And in my case, not doing so great with it. And I thought that's just how it was for me. And as the, and this was as a kid, teenage years, going to college and but just kind of progressively, some of my habits and behaviors got more and more extreme, but I would continue to say, well, I'll go to bed late. I'll wake up later. I'm an entrepreneur so I can sleep in. So what's the big deal? Who cares? Not connecting the dots with kind of some of these maladaptive behaviors and my poor health. And what that looked like was the beginnings of an ulcer, shingles in my 20s, anxiety. Jeez. Yeah, all these things that were now I can look back hindsight 2020 and see that how I was certainly managing things was not working, but also not connecting the dots for my sleep. And it wasn't until as this serial entrepreneur in Manhattan, burning the candle at both ends, stressed to the max, that it was when I finally went through this period of insomnia where I had this, for the first time in my life, this um, kind of sense of fear around my sleep. I started to kind of develop this sleep anxiety where the sun would be setting and my heart would start racing and I would start dreading the nights and fearing the nights of, I can't go another night like this. I feel like I'm losing my mind was the real fear. So I went to the doctors, left with sleeping pills, and that's not really supposed to be how it goes first go around. It is supposed to now in the United States anyway, be CBTI is supposed to be the kind of first line that we're supposed to be introduced to, but that didn't quite go that way for me. What and is, I left. What is that? Yeah, that's cognitive what, behavior that, therapy. Exactly. Yep. Okay. Cognitive behavioral therapy specifically for insomnia and insomnia being kind of more defined as difficulty falling asleep, staying asleep, early morning awakenings. Uh, and so for me, 
I had this moment of standing here with my sleeping pill prescription and coming from a family with a lot of pharmaceutical use and seeing what that path looked like for them. It was very fearful for me that, okay, now what am I embarking on? So this kind of lit this fire to understand, like, how do I restore this area of my life? But also I met a lot of problems along the way. I remember vividly trying to find support groups or places that I could go to discuss this. I felt very shameful, alone fearful that I was going to be stuck like this, that this was this ongoing problem. Like I flipped a switch and now I just can't sleep. So flat going forward, I ended up trying a lot of things, spending a lot of money and time, energy and effort, things that worked, things that didn't work. But in the whole period of all this, discovered a number of things, including what completely continues to fascinate me, this world of chronobiology, the science of time and how time affects our biology, as well as circadian rhythm entrainment, this idea that we all have this circadian rhythm that we can strengthen, that I certainly was not aware of and was doing everything unbeknownst to me that to weaken the strength of my circadian rhythm. And so once I just started discovering this, it created this blueprint for me of how to live and conduct my life in alignment with these rhythms of nature, not from woo perspective, but from a biological hardwired perspective. And what came out of it was amazing. Started restoring my sleep, not only to how it was, which as I shared, wasn't that great, but now getting to an optimal, quantifiably optimal kind of sleep opportunities as it comes from wearable trackers, in-lab sleep studies and other things. So what I discovered was something that I could not stop talking about. So organically, these small groups started emerging, uh, started a you know online um, newsletter. Then it grew into this podcast. Uh, so now we have the number two sleep podcast. We have online courses to help people go through this process. We have one of the larger databases of Aura Ring users. If you're familiar with that, sleep tracker. Um, so we have, you know, hundreds and hundreds of people utilizing the aura ring and we could see really on a granular level, what are some of the things that can move the needle for people in improving their sleep over time? And we have a particular niche in high stakes poker. So we work with a lot of high stakes poker players on improving their sleep, gamifying their sleep, and they're in a casino designed on purpose to confuse your circadian rhythms. They're a great test case. So I say all that, not to just say that, but to say that what I experienced was a place of thinking that sleep was just, uh, I was this lot that I was born into and I had these particular sets of results and it turned out that I was very wrong about how I was thinking about my sleep. And I'm clear after working with so many people that many of us have this opportunity to tap into this thing that we do a third of our lives on average, 26 years of our lives are spent asleep and we don't think that much about it. So that's my story. <laughs> Oh, great. I love it. it. Let's start with maybe some basics and some basic com concepts around sleep. One of the big questions that oftentimes get bought up that I get asked a lot is quantity versus quality. We've all heard you, you need to sleep eight hours or, or pick your number, but I'd love to hear uh, your thoughts on whether it really is a set amount of sleep that we need or whether kind of the quality of your sleep is what matters most. Yeah, great, great call out. So a couple of ways to think about that. And so duration is important, how many hours you are logging. That's important. But to your point, then it goes deeper than that. Then what is the quality of those hours that you're logging? What's the regularity of those hours that, you log that you're logging? I have a lot of people that say, oh, yeah, I always get eight hours, no problem. Then we take a look at their stats and then they might be all over the place in the times that they're going to bed, the times that they're waking up. That can be uh, a real sign that we're dealing with certain things like social jet lag. You don't get on a plane, but you're experiencing jet lag just because it's all over the place. Social we, jet lag. That's a good word. Good phrase. Good term, right? Exactly. <laughs> and many of us are dealing with that one. But beyond that, then we can also look to some of, uh, as you were speaking to, that quality piece, but that can go into the realm of sleep fragmentation. So how often are you waking up throughout the course of the night? Of those wake-ups, are you aware of those wake-ups or are they only coming up on trackers and you're it's not you're not cognizant of them, but they're still disrupting your sleep? Sleep fragmentation can be a hallmark of something that we're coining sleep age. So you know how you can test for your chronological versus biological age nowadays? You can now, there's 
there, we're putting together this conversation of your sleep age and a older sleep age is characteristic of some of those things that you're pointing to. So some of this poor quality of sleep, but also sleep duration often being lower. So there are many factors that go into that, that overarching piece of, are you quote unquote, a good sleeper or a bad sleeper? What are the, the unmistakable signs that you're a bad sleeper? Yeah. So, well, one, I think might surprise some people because a lot of people I talk to and I say what I do and then they say, okay, well, that must be nice for some people, but I fall asleep the minute my head hits the pillow. I'm a fantastic sleeper. That right there is a counter or a counterintuitive red flag that something is actually probably wrong or not, not working with your sleep. The reason being is that we should have, so sleep latency, the time that it takes for you to fall asleep. We like to have that be somewhere in the realm around 10 to 15 minutes or so that can indicate that you're not overly sleep deprived because falling asleep the minute your head hits the pillow or in, while you're watching a movie or certain times are just not, not indicative of really being well rested at the right times. If you're falling asleep immediately, that can be a sign that we might be dealing with an undiagnosed sleep disorder, sleep deprivation, or otherwise. But that would be one that most people aren't aware of. But then other ones that people might be more aware of are some of the difficulty falling asleep, staying asleep, early morning awakenings that goes under the category of insomnia. But then there's also the group that maybe they can fall asleep. They maybe can stay awake, stay asleep throughout the course of the night. Maybe they're not waking up early but they might not be prioritizing their sleep. So for some of my poker players, I might see that where they're dealing with just kind of difficult schedules or, or shift workers or other things. So if you want to look at what bucket you're dealing with. Can you unpack that not prioritizing your sleep a yeah. little bit more? Because it sounds like there's a lot more detail there than at least is making sense to me. Shift totally. workers, I understand. Totally. That's that's a, I've lived with a shift worker for a night for a while and that's a bloody nightmare. Oh, absolutely. Right. And, and shift workers and ugh, so grateful for the work that they do and doing such important work for our society. And yet that can be difficult for them to balance, or if they're having just a lot of demands on them and their time, then they might be able, not be able to log the sufficient number of hours. They might not be able to get into bed with that total sleep opportunity time. So that's something in their circumstances are hitting at their ability to get great sleep. And then if we unpack that a little more to your point, then there might be the group that maybe is dealing with something that's another trendy term called revenge bedtime procrastination. This is something that kind of gained some popularity Never during heard COVID. That. <laughs> Very funny term. And what that is pointing to is that so many of us maybe are dealing with a lot of pings on our attention or time or what have you. And so then it can feel like the only time that we have a bit of time to ourselves or just to do nothing or relax, then we might have that in the evening and then we're stealing time away from our own sleep. So it's hurting no one but us really, but we're still doing this, whether it's, you can point to a lot of things. Is it the addiction of our phones or all the stimuli? What is it? But one of the things that I would point to for all of these problems is that for many people, now there are asterisks that might not apply to certain groups, but for many people, I find that beginning with tracking your sleep to get a sense of what is going on can be a great place to begin. So you can start to see, are you someone that isn't giving yourself just a long enough sleep opportunity? You just don't have enough time that you're getting into bed and that you have to get up when the alarm goes off and there's just not sufficient time for you to log that type of quality sleep. And we might see that very clearly with if we utilize wearable trackers, or if you're not into the tracking game, even just keeping an old school sleep diary or log, all of that can be really insightful. Chronobiology. Well, this is a this is a podcast about health. Yeah, and we're not afraid to get down and dirty with some of the the biochemistry and so forth and so on. I would love to hear more about this field of chronobiology uh absolutely assuming so you can assuming you can give us that 
Well, if we think about even the title, so anything chrono relating to time and biology, of course, then as you're pointing to, I'm assuming you've delved into that quite a bit on this podcast. So time, how time affects our biology. Now, I am of the estimation, and I've been speaking on this now internationally on what I proclaim like Nostradamus or something, that in the future, we will be talking about this conversation around time and these rhythms. So as it relates to circadian rhythms, infradian rhythms, these various rhythms and biorhythms that impact our health results more readily. So this, if we're thinking about the science of time and how time affects our biology, we're starting to see more of this coming out. You spoke about shift workers or being connected and seeing firsthand what being a shift worker can, how that can disrupt certain things in our lives. We know this to be true from many you know, reputable sites and studies that even just doing things at the time of day that are upside down to the rhythms of our nature as human beings, as human beings, we're diurnal creatures, meaning that we're meant to be be active by day and at rest at night. So anytime we start deviating you, from Hold on, that, hold on just a minute. When you say we are meant to be that way, mm -hmm. uh, there's got to be more to it than just that. We are meant to. Why, how, why do we know that? Well, if we think about rats, they're nocturnal creatures, right? So we know that, okay, as nocturnal creatures, active at night. So that's something, a category that we've been, that they're in, right? And we're not right. in that category. So one of the things that we see is that why would there be these deleterious health effects for a person engaging in activities really nothing much different besides the fact that now they're active at night and that would be shift workers. So we have plenty of studies that point to what happens when people are working at night. Well, we see one, cancer rates go up. So we see things like breast cancer and prostate cancer in particular, really having clear signs and correlations with circadian disruption. And circadian disruption, what is that? Circadian rhythm is around 24 hours by which we're operating on this rhythm. And if you're disrupted from that, if you're not entrained in that strong circadian rhythm, then things can start to go awry. So there's that. The same, en engaging in the same kind of biological activities that you have choices over at the same time every day. At the same time every day. But going to bed at the same time, waking up at the same time, eating at the same times. Aligned. Uh, with certain zeitgebers. Zeitgebers is a term that means time givers. So time givers are things that tell our body what time it is and what to be doing when. The most important time giver or zeitgeber is light. So that is the big one that we're finding to the point that actually this year, a preprint just came out with 250 circadian biologists that are all calling for warning labels on light bulbs at night. Why? Because when we're using warning labels on light bulbs at night, we're finding the risk of things like that cancer going up. Diabetes, risk for diabetes going up and metabolic dysfunction, mental health concerns. And then certainly what we came probably to talk about is the sleep-wake disruption that we're seeing for so many people. But what's really exciting about this area, I think, is that it can start to point to Oh my gosh, I had no idea for many people had no idea that something as innocuous as a light bulb using at night can throw off some of our rhythms to a point that is measurable and study worthy. This, they're actually pointing to 2,700 peer reviewed studies to support this urge to bring on these warning labels on light bulbs at night. That's an example. Circling back to the shift workers, what you're saying is that even if you're consistent in the shift work, so you work that same overnight shift, just the fact that you're up at night, working at night, is problematic in itself. Because I, I was always under the impression that difficulty came when you were kind of going back Rotating. and forth. You sometimes work day and then you work night. But very you're important. saying even consistently working night is problematic. Yeah, no, that's a very important point. So you touched on something very key because we do see that 
rotating shift work is particularly problematic for people. So when we've got a couple night shifts and then we go to midday shift and let's do it again or whatever, that can be super, super problematic. The other thing we can find to be problematic is even if people do have consistent shifts, then they're practicing unbeknownst to them that social jet lag like we were talking about before, where then on the weekends, they want to be with their family. They want to do some engage in maybe normal schedule of things. Activity. yeah. Right. Totally. And so when they start doing that, then that can really throw things off. But even beyond that, because I don't want to scare shift workers. And if anyone is a shift worker listening, I just want you to be aware that this is clear. This is listed as a possible cancer causing agent, this process of working at night. We can look at World Health Organization and other established groups that have called this out. So be aware of this. There are things you can do to help soften that or support yourself like you're pointing to as much consistency as you can possibly have. That can make a big difference. But yes, to your point, if there is a lot of variability, but there is just that clear element that if we are being active at night with these faux lights in our environment, this is doing something to our biology that we're not fully understanding and seems to result in some of these deleterious health effects. Can can you dive into the... I'm, I've got two different questions. I'll ask them both at the, and then take it where you want. Blue light blockers have kind of been a thing. I'd love to hear your thoughts about the use of blue light blockers. And then secondarily, my understanding is that our circadian rhythm, specifically our sleep-wake cycle, is driven by the levels of cortisol in our in our system at any given time. I became aware of this a long, long time ago because I was having I was having problems. And my doctor explained to me that your cortisol is supposed to rise in the morning. Your body warms up when that happens. And it, part of the reason that you, you tend to get colder is because the levels of cortisol drop. And so I started to become very aware of in the morning, I'd feel my body getting warmer and I go, oh, my cortisol is going up. And at night it's cooled off. So I'm guessing, I don't know this, but I'm guessing that Part of what happens when your sleep is disrupted is that hormone cycle is is being disrupted. Could you talk about that as well? And those may be yeah. related. No, it's a gr- great question. So first off, yes, a very popular test that people might engage in if they're dealing with difficulty with their sleep could be things like the Dutch test. So testing cortisol levels throughout the course of the day, and then how your melatonin levels are functioning in the evening and seeing, do we have that strong pulse, but kind of a Goldilocks effect of that cortisol in the morning around the same time each day. And that's where that regularity becomes so important. So if anyone, if people are like, well, what are some practical takeaways out of all this? If you just do not nothing else, but get up at around the same time every day to support to your point, that clear cortisol pulse, that can be a great place to begin, including the weekends. So that clear cortisol pulse can happen because a delayed kind of signature of disrupted sleep is often delayed cortisol pulse and it's pushed out. And then that can further disrupt things like your melatonin pulse. And so we want a really strong melatonin pulse in the evening. And what happens when your melatonin is pulsing? Well, then we hope then your cortisol is going down and then that's facilitating this preparation for sleep. And then our body temperature to your point is then going to go down. We're going to downregulate. It's almost going to help automatize this process of sleep so that we don't have to try so hard to sleep. We don't have to do a million meditations and all these different things. If you want to, you can. But if we have these things working, then this should really help kind of usher us off to sleep. Now, What are some things that could disrupt our, for instance, melatonin pulse? Well, you mentioned the blue blockers. What I would say there is that one of the reasons that we're, that that call to arms of the warning labels on light bulbs at night, not just to be cutesy, but instead to point to this kind of prevalence of evening lighting post sunset disrupting our melatonin production. And certainly melatonin got a lot of press over COVID and at other points and for many different reasons. And so what are some of the things that can disrupt that? Well, certainly one irregularity and pushing that out too late 
But two, having those artificial lights at night, because you pointed to circadian rhythm and its connection with cortisol. So circadian rhythm in trainment is one of the things we do with sleep is a skill and how to entrain and strengthen your circadian rhythm. Cause you can really have a weak circadian rhythm or a strong circadian rhythm. So it's kind of on a spectrum and you might fall somewhere in between there. Many of us are running around with kind of a weak circadian rhythm, one in which you're not having that clear cortisol pulse in the morning, clear melatonin pulse in the evening, but what are the ways to impact your circadian rhythm? The top most important one, that Zeitgeber, is light dark. The second one being related to temperature, and you pointed to temperature beautifully, and so that's something that we see very clearly can impact the workability and automation of this rhythm, and then also so your sleep quality. So if you're testing and tracking your sleep, one of the easiest ways that I see for people to improve things like some of their sleep quality, limit sleep fragmentation, the wake-ups throughout the course of the night, as well as the quality of their sleep, lowering their heart rate while they're sleeping, improving HRV is things like cooling mattress pads. So chilly sleep, eight sleep, but also just lowering the temperature in your environment as much as you can, even though our current modern day bedding makes it more challenging because we're kind of rotisserie t- chicken insulated in our bedding, <laughs> which is the problem. So true. <laughs> yeah. Right. Oh gosh. Yeah. So, so those are some things that I could point to. So, yeah, I mean, so, so many different interesting aspects of this to get into, but I wanted to ask you about the relationship between sleep and insulin resistance specifically. It's a big thing that we talk about here around metabolic health And I'd love to hear your perspective on that. Sure. Yeah. Well, one, I just realized I didn't fully answer the blue blocking question. So that could lead us into, uh, okay. (laughs) So so just to complete some of that, because that can play into that conversation that you, you shared on the insulin piece, our glucose, how the functionality of that is the interplay there. So blue blockers are, there's different types of blue blockers. Some people have clear blue blockers, and I would say those are not sufficient, not going to do anything really to support you in the evening. If you're using blue blockers in the evening, and they're also not like a free pass to then have as much light in your environment, they can be, they can kind of mitigate some of the effects if you have amber or red lenses. Now there's lots of different, lots of different conversations around that. I would not rest on my rest my laurels or hopes on the blue blockers. I would aim to change our environment as much as possible, but they can be helpful. Say if you want to watch, I don't know, Game of Thrones or something and you throw them on and there's some blue, blue light coming out to not be quite bowled over as much. There's different studies to support that. But I would say that that's something that can help ensure that you're not disrupting your melatonin as much to make it easier to fall asleep and stay asleep. Now, if for the person that is not getting a great night of sleep, what we find is that even with one night of insufficient sleep, that we can see an uptick. And it sounds like you guys have touched on this as far as this uptick in our even just resting glucose rate. And for those that are using continuous glucose monitors, they might see, oh, wow, geez, I'm my numbers are suddenly just have gone up and now I'm more likely to be craving some of these things that I might not normally because of this biological impact of not getting enough of that sleep the night before. That is after, we well, certainly are studies that point to that after one night, but then if you augment that into multiple nights, you can very quickly impact that stability and workability of the glucose insulin kind of dynamics. Zowie. Yeah. Very, very important. And and something I, I oftentimes recognize in my patients these days, looking at their continuous glucose monitors, and I'm like, you didn't sleep very well that night. And they're yes. like, how'd you know? Uh, but yeah, you can definitely see the signature uh, patterns there. I would say if, if anyone is curious about that, we have had levels, Nutrisense, Cygnos, very who else? I think we're going to have testimonial. So many of the representatives from different continuous glucose monitor companies, at least in the United States and varies outside of the United States, touching on this and what they're seeing as well is being part of many of them actually put it into their kind of IP on how they're thinking about training people to improve their glucose regulation and stability is around sleep being a key pillar of the management of our glucose. And so related question, what are your recommendations around eating and sleep and how how 
how long before you want to go to sleep should you stop eating? Are there certain types of foods that are more problematic closer to bedtime? Oh, this is one of my favorite questions. So this is another fascinating topic. So I mentioned this fancy term zeitgeber, which points to time giver. So if you open any chronobiology textbook, they'll point to these different zeitgebers, right? Well, another zeitgeber or time giver is food and what time we're eating our food. And it's telling the body what to be doing and when, and it's communicating with all these cells, trillions of uh, clocks within every cell and organ in our body and aiming to stay on time. And so one of the signs is what time are we eating? Well, one thing that I can point to is we actually recently had Dr. Sachin Panda out of the Salk Institute, and he's one of the premier thinkers in this area at the moment. So decades of research out of the Salk Institute on circadian meal timing. So one of the things that he has found in his research is certainly aiming to be aligned with some of these rhythms of nature. How could you align with kind of circadian intermittent fasting, if you will, but that sounds more extreme than it really is. It's more just that you're giving yourself a little bit of digestive time breaks in the evening, especially. So out of his research, it's about three hours being around the time for to have your last bite of food and how that can support and improve your sleep and help and train your circadian rhythm. Now, anecdotally, for seeing hundreds and hundreds of people's different wearable trackers, I have seen some really interesting improvements for people when they've tested things like four to five hours being uh, the timeline for their last bite of food and some people even more. Now, this is again, anecdotal. These are bio-individual, so something to be aware of, but this can start to go into something that is called that circadian rhythm intermittent fasting, and that's a bit more seasonal as well. So what would that look like that you're eating when it's light out, not eating as much when it's dark out? And that makes a lot of sense in the summer, but in the winter for many people, then suddenly it's dark at like 430. That can be a little more challenging for people, but it is really noteworthy that we do see a lot of changes. And even when you spoke to the glucose and insulin piece and leptin and ghrelin levels, that those, all these things are working on their own circadian rhythm. So we do find that if people are eating something, the same thing at 8 a.m., versus the same thing at 8 p.m. that there seems to be less of an ability to handle that in the same way at the 8 p.m. group than the 8 a.m. group. So it seems to be that there's we're designed to be aligned with these rhythms of nature more than we might have realized. Yeah, you think? <laughs> <laughs> Well, um, so to that point, most people are eating most of their day and night. This is the problem. So we're seeing this over and over again. What is the problem for that? Well, it's impacting their glucose regulation, but it's also impacting their ability to get great sleep. So every time you eat too, that's going to warm up your body temperature just a bit as well. So that's going to also impact your ability to fall asleep with ease, stay asleep. So many people that complain of wake ups at around 3 a.m. or what have you, they might want to look at what's going on with their glucose. They might want to pull on, put on the CGM that you were speaking to. As you're going to see that for many people, it's a whole mess. And most people, even talking about America, we see that wild numbers of people are eating all throughout the course of the day. So there's frequent eating and they might not even register it. So, oh, here's another apple. Oh, here's some almonds, whatever. Even if it's healthy, not healthy, it's a lot of eating. And every time you're turning on those digestive clocks, that's sending confusing signals. Now that's that's a, a a unique thought for me, right? Uh, yeah. It hadn't occurred to me that um, I I've thought of 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 meals as a rhythmic experience, sure, but I hadn't thought of eating as being something that starts the timer biologically on this whole range of chemical reactions. I just thought of it as digestion. Ah, I put food in it. it right. you know, my body goes to work and digests and blah, blah, blah. Exactly. Um, that's, that's a lot to think about. I want to hear stories though. So give us a great before and after story from somebody came to you and had a problem and we fixed it. And this was the result. 
Sure. Specifics, please. Yeah, let's see. So, well, the first one that comes to mind is a dramatic poker player story, of course. So (laughs) someone that had been going to bed, so they're online player. So they actually did have the opportunity to kind of design their days a bit more. They'd had access to different games that are available at different times. So we were actually, when they came in, they were going to bed at around 4.35 in the morning every night. So that was just had bed like that for years and years. And they had had also their stats on the order ring even before we were doing anything together. And so that was really helpful because we could see just years of data. Then what we started doing was working together to one, do what we were speaking about, the piece on shift workers and kind of relating to them like a shift worker. Okay. So if we're going to be going to bed at around that time, they had had so much variability too. So it would be like that one day and then the other day, oh, getting up earlier, another day getting up later. So that roller coaster, we see a lot of that. So even just beginning with stabilizing that from kind of a shift working perspective, help support the change in a number of their metrics, their heart rate averages, their HRV the quality of their sleep, et cetera. But then as we started aligning there and helping them understand the power of this strong circadian rhythm piece, they started moving earlier and earlier and actually were surprised by how much they were liking that. Over time, they started shifting over to these earlier online games so that they were able to then think now live a lifestyle that is much more circadian aligned to the point that now they started going to bed around 11 seven o'clock, which for them was like, you know, as compared to the 5 a.m. and what have you, um, was a totally different reality. And now they're getting to experience time outside. This becomes a big component of this. That's actually part of the reason I moved to Austin was to get more sunlight. And I'd been in, you know, grew up in Maine, lots of Northern latitude location, went to school at Syracuse and then lived in Manhattan for years. So, you know, dealt with all those winter months and all the things where you might hibernate inside. So for them, they actually ended up moving to another location so that they could have more sun options and then having that more circadian aligned lifestyle. Latitude. Um, The farther you are from the equator, the greater the variability in daylight uh, versus night throughout the year. Are there any studies on how, (laughs) is the circadian rhythm, does the circadian rhythm itself adjust based on the amount of daylight you're exposed to? Or or is it just a regular clock that if you're living in Helsinki, sometimes your, your, your internal alarm clock goes up, goes off three hours before dark, and sometimes it goes off three hours after dark. Yeah. Oh, great question. Do we do we do we know? Yeah. So a couple of things that we know. So one, this can fall under the domain of kind of health geography. And so where we're living on the globe impacting our health, which is really an interesting conversation. But one thing we can point to that has a decent amount of da- data around it that's novel and illustrative is MS. So MS, we find that there seems to be a higher prevalence rates of MS the more north you are of the equator, particularly past the 37th parallel. And the 37th parallel on the globe seems to be this kind of line of demarcation. We start to see a rise up in rates of MS the further away you're getting into those northern latitude locations. Lots of theories on the why, but it certainly does seem to be noteworthy enough that it's discussed and looked at. So what could we extract from that as a kind of a mitochondrial based real disease? Quick, real yeah, quick. Go ahead. Where's the 37th parallel? So actually it goes right, we're talking about Vegas beforehand. So it's right kind of along Vegas being part of it in the United States, right along LA and then kind of near around the Carolinas. So you kind of just kind of align it right down. So what I did- So the bulk of the United States population is north of- North. Yes. The 37th parallel. And what happens when you're north of the 37th parallel? You, one of the things that can be challenging is to get sufficient vitamin D. And right. we're finding more and more how much, one, vitamin D just in general, um, COVID, et cetera, but how much that seems to be a player in this sleep conversation. So if you have insufficient vitamin D, we're finding correlations with poor sleep. We're finding correlations with things like sleep apnea. And so there's a big question of, 
what's going on there. And so certainly if you do have insufficient vitamin D levels and you are in those Northern latitude locations, we want to be really aware of this so we can take certain steps. Now I will say from a biohacker perspective or things that you could do kind of gadget wise, if people are interested, there are two companies that have lights that you can generate vitamin D from a light, which is pretty novel. And so there's only two companies that I know of. One's called Spurdy, and you can some people can get that covered under their insurance if they're dealing with things like psoriasis, eczema, et cetera. Um, but then it can also be utilized for seasonal effective and what have you. There's that one, and it's sold like hotcakes during COVID. Then there's another kind of newer one called Chroma D, and they're also linking in red light within there as well. But you can literally like sunburn yourself with these things. <laughs> so just to call out. So some people in northern latitude locations will invest in things like this because there are certain benefits that can come from getting light exposed vitamin D versus supplement taking supplements. But certainly that might be something that we would consider is what type of how much we're supplementing with if we are in these northern latitude locations, particularly if we're talking about the United States from around October to going into the early spring months, that's where you're at a major disadvantage to be able to get sufficient vitamin D because now the sun is having to stretch across the globe and the power of the sun becomes weaker during those months. So what would happen? You said a really great thing about, well, what does our circadian rhythm kind of shift? One really practical thing is that when those days change and we go into the winter months and the nights are longer, historically, what we would have thought of is this kind of becomes a season of melatonin and a time where we would have slept more. And if you're in particularly in those northern latitude locations, you could take advantage of the colder environment almost getting built in cold therapy, which can build up more mel uh, mitochondrial kind of production from brown fat perspective. So you can be gathering that in those northern latitude locations in the past. But now since we have indoor living, certain stats point to that around 93% of our day in the United States is spent indoors. That was back in 2001, um, a stat out of the EPA. And that was before pandemic, smartphones, Netflix, all the things. It's probably way more. So most of us are no longer being exposed to some of those signs and cues that would signal this is winter. This is a time to sleep more. This is a time where we can make up and change that circadian rhythm to a certain extent as a way to repair. We're not necessarily doing that as much anymore. Let, uh, I want to jump in and talk about a little bit of a different aspect of sleep. We've talked a lot about sort of timing and getting to sleep. How about staying asleep? Because I know oh. this is a challenge for so many people. They'll oh. go to sleep, they'll fall asleep okay. And then for whatever reason, they're waking up in the middle of the night and then have trouble getting back to sleep. Yeah, totally. That's probably one of the more common things that I hear people really, really just hitting their head on the wall about is they cannot uh, deal with a, the, another 3 a.m. wake up, 4 a.m. wake up. So there's a couple of things to say about that. One, that's differentiating between are some of these understandable and normal wake ups and that are totally fine and innocuous, or are we starting to go into a category of too frequent of wake ups? How long are we staying awake? So is it taking us a long, long time to fall back asleep? So guys, getting some data on this can be helpful. But beyond that, what are some of the common reasons for wake ups? Well, there are a bunch. So one, even just the least sexy one, but probably the one that I see most often and no one likes to hear about is just the plain old boring regular regularity, bringing regularity to your sleep time. You go to bed around the same time, you wake up at around the same time. When you start deviating from that, then the body has some confusion on what to be doing and when, and then you can often find yourself waking up at different times or the quality of your sleep can be impacted. So that's like the least fun one, but probably the one of the bigger <laughs> lever movers in, in the conversation. So there's that one. Another one would be the glucose piece that you spoke to so often. If some of the stats seem, if some of the stats that we've seen come out recently in recent years around around 88% of Americans having metabolic dysfunction, some pointing to even low 90s, either way you cut it, probably a lot of people with some metabolic dysfunction. If that is the case, it would make sense that then we would also, however you are by day, tends to get mirrored at night. So if you're roller coastering on your glucose levels throughout the course of the 
day, then it's likely happening at night. And we see particularly when it's crashing, seeming to bring about a lot of wake ups for people. And not only are those the type of not only are those wake ups where you're awake and then you go back to sleep, but these tend to be a stress response type wake up because now the body has had that glucose crash and that was a little stressful for it and sound the alarms. And now you're awake and it's going to maybe have some trouble going back to sleep. So that's another common one. Other ones that people don't like to hear. My husband always says I should have a show called Molly Ruins Everything because (laughs) uh, the other one people don't like are alcohol, THC. I'm sorry. I saw your cup with the... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and listen, I, I'm all for it. Ta-da! Exactly. So, By the way, <laughs> that's that's coffee in that cup right there. See? That's, that's coffee. totally exactly. good for sleep. Totally good for sleep. Exactly. So pointing to things like THC, alcohol can certainly both help people fall asleep. We do see that in many studies often can help support sleep onset for both of those. However, going into later in the night, we do tend to see more fragmentation, more overt fragmentation from alcohol. Like clearly you're waking up and you're getting hotter and all these things. Whereas THC seem to have a little different effect from certain studies that we see. We'd love to see more studies, but for some people, there might be more of this insidious kind of just poor sleep quality and maybe some wake ups and some that they might not even log or remember. So that one's a little tricky, but certainly the alcohol piece is very, very clear. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Got it. Okay. I'll keep going. So other wake up reasons that can be at play heat temperature. So I mentioned the piece about cooling mattress pads is just one of the easiest ways that I see for people if it's available in their budget to help minimize the number of wake ups you're having, particularly for women going through different stages of their cycle and and potentially moving into menopause and hot flashes, but certainly even just at different periods, courses throughout their period, we can see different wake ups at different times. But then for all genders and all people, we do see that if your environment is too hot or you're getting too hot in that rotisserie chicken thing I was talking about where you're covered in a duvet and you got maybe foam mattresses, just so unnatural to how we would have slept for thousands of years as hunter gatherers. What was likely is we would have been sleeping on the ground, which would have been part of the coldest part of the environment. And with that, that seemed to support quality sleep and less sleep fragmentation. Now they had other reasons to wake up and fearful of their environment or whatever, but the temperature piece could help support the quality of that sleep. So that's one. And then you can also get into other things like prescription medications, stress, anxiety, depression, other things. So there's a long list. Is there a, this is the single most recommended step I take to help people sleep better? Is there one that once you've you've checked with somebody, this is the one that most often you recommend and most often helps? Sure. I would say- Uh, Actually, that's a bad question. Yeah. What is the one? Okay. (laughs) Love it. Because you could just say yes- and we yeah. go on. So. Yeah, right. that's a good point. Okay, so- Yes, there I'm... is. Next question. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> yeah, later. So what I would say is, and this, I go, you won't even, most people don't even believe that there are actual conferences around sleep. And there, you know, one's coming up next year, Sleep 2024. The, and it's, the jokes write themselves. The jokes write themselves. Totally. Uh, we're here all night, except hopefully not too much, not impacting our sleep. But so, so I go to these sleep conferences, right? And some big takeaways from- Um, some of these conferences with some of the brightest minds putting their head on the case of how to improve sleep often come shake out to as simple as bright days, dark nights, as simple as that, right? But what is the practical application of that look like? Well, we had a NASA subject matter expert on the podcast recently, and he spoke to his estimations being that globally, most people are experiencing 3x to dark of days and 3x to bright of nights. So what is that doing? Well, it's very much confusing our circadian rhythm because especially the suprachiasmatic nucleus is that main master clock in the, the brain. Who? 
<laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. What is that? So the SCN, if, if easier to throw out there is mm. directly connected to the eyes. So that's why it's so important. The light piece. So it's sampling the environment constantly to get a sense of what should it be doing when then it's communicating to all those peripheral clocks in every cell and organ in the body and telling it, okay, it was around 9 PM. So we're going to do X, Y, Z. So with that, if we are having the wrong signals constantly, and what does that look like in number terms? Well, the average indoor environment, most indoor environments tend to be around sub 1000 lux in the environment, right? So you go into, and I have people, you can test this on your phone. You can download like a free app. Lux um, is a popular one or light meter. You can download these and you can test your environment. So have people do that. They might go into their Starbucks that they always work from and they spend a bunch of hours there. They test it and they say, oh, geez, wow. Okay. There's only 300 lux in here. Why does that matter? Well, what we're looking for is high amplitude, bright days, markedly dark nights. And so what would high amplitude, bright days look like in nature? Around a hundred thousand lux is what it can get to outside when you're being exposed to light outdoors, certainly near the equator and really strong light in the summer. In um, Phoenix, almost uh, every day of the year. Phoenix, to, right. You're, <laughs> like, exactly. So, so very bright, very bright amount of lux that would have been present because we would have been outdoor creatures for so long. Now that we've gone indoors, we've found these new diseases crop up over the years. And we saw that there's a lot of really interesting uh, kind of timelines that you can look in at as people start moving indoors, weird things start to rickets and all these things start popping up. And we have questions around, well, what is going on? It There seems that there could be a correlation between our environment and the effects. So now- Our light what, environment. Our light environment. So you want to get your light right. So now- if you're upping the amount of bright light that you're getting exposed to by day, then you want to markedly post sunset, help mimic what would be happening in nature. So in our space, my husband does not like it, but now he's turned, now he's just accepts it that he calls me Darth Vader. So in the nights, everything turns red each night re consistently. And so why do we do that? Because we're looking for spectrums of light that are devoid of particularly blue. We have some questions around could green impact things. Things, but that's more speculative. But certainly blue light is clear, impacts uh, melatonin production. So how do we minimize that? You can have red lights, you can have amber coloring, lights that are devoid of blue, candlelight, fire, etc. Yeah, so we're, we're mimicking the, 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 the light that we would have had pre-electric lights. Yes, exactly. Because fire, fire was the first or, biohack. Or, yeah. yeah. Because initially for so long, we didn't even have fire. And then we developed, oh, we can make fire and we can kind of create it and keep that. Well, what was characteristic of fire? Fire has a large amount of infrared light. So it skews high on the red spectrum. If you are to take, um, you know, kind of a inventory of what type of light is in there, a lot of red. Whereas many of us now find ourselves and actually just this year, what was made illegal in the United States was incandescent lights. That's the old light that Edison had created that little filament in it. It's like yeah. romantic and you go to a cute like restaurant and it's all like mood lighting. Those are now illegal. So those are illegal. And now LED lights are what you are going to get. And so LED lights, many, now that's not that they're all bad because you can get LED lights that have warmer spectrum or you can get things like Philip Hughes that can be automated and then you can turn them into more orange or red but unfortunately, many people just have plain old LEDs and that has a huge shot of blue, greens. If you're under fluorescent lights, it's very alien to our normal type of lighting. So that has yeah. a ton of blues. And yeah, so it can be super disruptive to your health. That's fascinating. We're really close to the bottom of the hour. And I, 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 I really want to get this last question in. Yeah. I want to go back to the shift workers. Sure. Is it possible if you're somebody who works at night and sleeps during the day um, to to mimic the day night uh, shift in light so that you're so at night work in an extremely bright environment and during the day darken your environment as much, much as possible? 
Has there been any kind of studies done on that? And is it possible to, to mimic the biological effects by, by fixing your environment, your light environment that way? Yeah, such a good question. So first off, we haven't quite been able to mimic the type of light that we get from this like magical giant sun and this full spectrum light and the true arc that it has. So if you really get into the phys physics of light, you could spend a lot of time just studying that of how different it is in the morning versus midday versus afternoon versus the, the whole thing. However, people are on the case of aiming to create circadian lighting. Practical applications can look like hospitals. So to help support improved healing. So we do have studies that point to things like if patients are in rooms that have windows and so they're a bit more connected to these rhythms of nature, do they leave the hospital faster? It seems to result in that in certain studies. Now, I will say windows are not a full fix. They're better. So all these windows I have behind me, these can dis still disrupt your circadian rhythm because in the morning, you want to get this bright light in your eyes and not from behind a window because there are studies that point to 50 to 100 times longer to reset your master clock when you're getting that light from behind a window versus just going outside. So this huh. is where you want to learn, right, about what happens to this light. How is it adulterated? So even if you're someone that is a truck driver, right, even if you could just roll down the window, quite a bit throughout your driving to get real true natural light in, that's going to be kind of a hack for you. Now for your real question though, about how can you manage as a shift worker, can you mimic these rhythms? You can certainly one, get curious and start to learn about some of these things so that you can help support yourself as much as possible. One book that's, I don't have a lot of books to recommend, unfortunately for shift workers, because there aren't a lot of them, but then this is why one just came out recently and got a lot of press called The Sleep Fix. And that got pressed because that was actually by an ABC correspondent uh, who went from a kind of journalistic perspective where she was a shift worker, she, journalist, and then would have to be on air at odd hours, oh, 3 a.m. Yeah. or whatever, but loved her job. And everyone would say, well, sorry, you should quit your job. And she would say, well, I want to keep my job. So what can I do? So she started interviewing a lot of people. And so that's one book in a nice place altogether that can have a lot of strategies for people of how to help support your rhythms, even if your rhythms are upside down to a lot of the rest of the society. And that can be really like problematic and a struggle for people. But once they become and get the education on it, then they can have a lot of tools at their disposal to help enact this. And some of it can just go to the practicalities of making sure that their environment when they get home has certain structures in place, total blackout. It's as cool as possible. We've communicated with the family to not go in there when you're sleeping. And how yeah. can we keep this to be in place all week, seven days a week, all of those sort of things. So the, the answer is we can certainly minimize a lot of those impacts. And then I think the more curious people can get, then they can really support these rhythms, maybe more than the average person is even aware of, and they might be doing just as much harm. I really did not think I would, we would get a solid hour of conversation and I would still have a whole lot of questions. Well, I, I looked at this and I said to myself, like, oh, geez. this is about a 12 minute conversation <laughs> and then I'm bored out of my skull. <laughs> wow. Well, I hope that is, that makes me very happy because truly my mission on the planet is to help support people in this area with their sleep. So a, a passion point for me is because truly when I was going through this part of what was so earth shattering and moving to me was I really felt like I was losing my mind. And we know that mental health and sleep are very much interconnected. We don't have really a single mental health disorder that doesn't have the presence of disrupted sleep there. So for me, that was really, really important. And what ended up coming out of it was oh my gosh, my whole experience of life that I had been living for all those years with kind of unnecessary, unbeknownst to me, anxiety, depression, all of these things that I was impacting my results and I had no clue. And I think a lot of us don't. So I'm so happy to hear that because anything I can do to help support people's interest and intrigue and hopefully fascination over this thing we do is really important to me. All right. Well, yeah, point amazing. our listeners. Yeah. Yeah. Point, so I, point I, our listeners. Go, oh God, Phil. We need somebody <laughs> off camera. I, I can tell this. We we need somebody off points, camera. Yeah. We need to have the little thing in our ear. It's okay, Phil. Now it's your turn. 
<laughs> Love it. <laughs> I think we're both trying to get to the same thing, though. But for, for those in our audience who want to really be proactive about this aspect of their health, which is something we talk a lot about, how can they learn more about how to sleep better? Sure, absolutely. So if they go to sleepisaskill.com, they can do a few things. So the first thing they can do is take a sleep assessment. So whatever's going on in their sleep, they can put that in there and then we'll auto trigger back some personalized things that they can do right away. The process that they can also, that will give them a couple of things. So a free optimized bedroom PDF. So that's 17 things, high tech, low tech things that they can do to improve their environment. And as we talked about environment really begets your results with your sleep in a lot of ways. So that is that free download. But it will also sign you up for our weekly newsletter. This newsletter I've been doing every Monday for five years or more at this point. And so with that, we've built this whole community of people that are interested in improving their sleep. So love to have you on there. It's called Sleep Obsessions. And so we put like screenshots of sleep stats and all kinds of things in there, latest studies, et cetera. And then if you're really struggling with your sleep, we do a couple of things. So one, we have sleep wearable audits. So we can audit your sleep stats. So if you're wearing Aura Ring, a whoop band, et cetera. Then we can take a look at those stats and give you some kind of tailored things that you can do. Then we also have a small group cohort so that we can take you through all of these do require an aura ring to participate because we believe in the observer effect or the Hawthorne effect, which is that call out that when we know we're being watched, we might be, you know, behave slightly differently. So the compliance tends to go up with that element. And so that's, that's also the six-year-old boy <laughs> totally. A hundred percent, right? Oh, what? You're watching oh, me? shoot. You're watching me. Oh, I guess I better clean my room. All right, fine. Well, we think we're so evolved, but turns out not so much. And then we also have one-on-ones if you're really struggling and want some kind of more on the ground support. Those are some ways to improve your sleep. I have one last question. Are your poker players making more money now? They are totally making more money now. I actually have one that's uh, messaging me from Vegas right now, and he's quite happy because so typically when he'll go to Vegas, all things go off the charts. And this guy is just such a character. He's a well-known name in poker. And right now he is so happy because now he just bagged quite a bit. And yet he's maintaining his sleep throughout the course of that. In the past, he might go off the rails when that would have either good or bad. So managing right. tilt for a poker player is important. And so the ability to emotionally regulate, we know we have plenty of studies that point to if you get great sleep, you can improve your ability to emotionally regulate. And we see that at the poker table. Amazing guest, Phil. Well, Never I am so grateful. In a grateful. million years, what I have guessed. <laughs> this was really good. This was uh, really, really good. Well, cultyourbrand.com and I fix hearts on the, the tagline for both of your names. Fantastic. You guys are all doing clearly important work. So thank you so much for having me. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much, Molly Eastman. So the website is sleep is a skill. Yes. Dot com. It's all spilled, spelled this, the, the way it sounds like. We'll have all the connection information in the show notes for those of you listening. I guess we're good. All right. Well, thank you. I appreciate the time. We'll talk to y'all next time.